So welcome everybody to our STEM series finale. Um, my name is Anita Gonzalez and I am the statewide program coordinator for New Mexico Mesa. Um, throughout the entire year, we've been hosting STEM series sessions, which um, just invite speakers to provide virtual workshops and opportunities um, to our students and our teachers and our Mesa network across the state and all things STEM. So our, our final um, series today is a culmination of all those experiences, as well as tying in our theme of designing for equity. That is a challenge that New Mexico Mesa took on this year, um, as well as a bigger, broader network of Mesa USA. So um, here with us today, we do have the director of the film Coded Bias, Shalini Kantaya. So if you've had the opportunity to watch the film Coded Bias, great. And if you have not, there is still lots of time after this talk to watch it. The film is available on Netflix. Um, or if you are a Mesa student or advisor, there is a special screening code that you can access through our registration for the event or by contacting me to get that code. And the viewing is available through May the 13th if you don't have access to Netflix to watch the film. Um, but with that, I will turn, um, turn the stage over to our distinguished guest to introduce herself um, and also to go ahead and get a little introduction into the film. Shalini? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to share the film Coded Bias with you. Um, I think it's conversations like this one that really give um, my life's work meaning. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, <clears throat> I, I just wanna say that, you know, sort of starting this film, uh, you know, three years ago, I didn't even know what an algorithm was. Um, every, you know, sort of my street cred in the game is that I am a science fiction fanatic and everything that I knew about artificial intelligence sort of came from the, the imagination of Steven Spielberg or Stanley Kubrick. I'm definitely someone who's watched Blade Runner way too many times. And um, I don't think that my background as a sci-fi fanatic really prepared me for um, how AI is being used in the now. And I stumbled down the rabbit hole when I read a book called Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. And I was just astounded to learn the ways in which we as human beings are outsourcing our decision-making to machines uh, in ways that really change lives and shape human destinies. And I didn't realize the extent to which algorithms, um, machine learning, AI is increasingly becoming this kind of invisible gatekeeper in society of opportunity, um, deciding really important things like who gets hired, uh, who gets what quality of healthcare, even how long a prison sentence someone may serve. And at the same time, as I was learning the ways in which we are putting our blind faith um, in machines, um, I saw a TED talk that Joy Bellamini gave and uh, was just shocked to learn that these same systems that we trust so implicitly um, to make you know, decisions that really uh, change lives have not been vetted for racial bias or for gender bias, or even more broadly that they won't hurt people, that they won't cause harm. And I was very surprised to learn that in many cases, these systems haven't been vetted for um, a shared sense of accuracy outside of the companies that stand to benefit economically from their deployment. And that's when I really began to realize that everything that I love as a free person living in a democracy, um, uh, everything from you know, access to fair and accurate information, um, you know, fair elections, uh, equal opportunity, um, civil rights, that communities of color don't get um, undue um, 
police scrutiny, that everything we care about is being uh, transformed by um, algorithms and by AI. And um, that's when I really began to realize what Joy Bellamwini um, articulates so clearly in the film that we could essentially roll back uh, 50 years of civil rights advances in the name of trusting these algorithms to be fair, to be unbiased, to be just, um, when in many cases they're not. And that set me on the journey to make this film. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. So how the rest of the format for this session is gonna work is I will be moderating the chat um, or if you're a brave soul and you wanna pipe up and turn on your mic and ask a question, um, please feel free to, to chime in and we'll, we'll moderate um, the rest of the discussion for the rest of the time. So um, if you have any questions about the film or you know in general, um, please feel free to, to shoot them out. Um, I will go ahead and pause now, give everyone a chance to respond via the chat, or again, if anyone wants to kick us off. And I don't know if you have access to the chat, um, Shalini, or would you like me to read out the questions? Is that easier for you? It would be preferred if you would read them. Okay, that's why I was just, just wanted to check. Um, so the first question was, how did you get into filmmaking and what would you suggest to someone interested in filmmaking? Hmm. Well, I fell in love with images. Um, I was in India and I was actually in one of the 13 villages that India gave Tibet. And I was the only lay person in the sea of monks. And I just was watching these monks sort of um, do their deep chanted prayer and um, aware of the fact that they were repli you know, sort of finding a way to replicate their culture in exile. And that's sort of when I realized that the power of visual images and that um, there's stories that I can't just express in words. And that's sort of when I fell in love very viscerally with, with visual images. And um, my advice to someone who uh, wants to do uh, film is uh, if you can do anything else professionally, do that other thing. Um, for me, I couldn't do anything else. This is what I was born to do. And I, I literally can't do anything else. And so um, th this is what I love doing with a passion. Um, but what I, my advice would be to, um, you know, there've never been so many tools to tell your story. Um, you, you know, if you have a phone, you have a camera and, um, you know, I wouldn't wait for funding or for anything else to start making, you know, small films on your camera with the technology that you have and, um, trying to tell stories with the, with just what you have would be my advice as you're starting out. Well, thank you for that. I do have, um, not in the chat, but I do have, um, you gave us a little bit about your motivation to make the film and maybe lessons you learned a little bit there. Um, would you be able to maybe summarize the film in the event that maybe individuals on here haven't had a chance to watch it yet? Absolutely. Coded Bias follows um, the work of MIT Media Lab scientist, uh, Joy Bellamwini, who quite by accident uh, she's just trying to get an art project to work, and she stumbles upon the fact that facial recognition does not see her uh, dark face clearly, and she has to sort of uh, puts on a white mask that is sort of wider than anyone's skin tone uh, before the camera will see her face as a face, and it sort of takes her on a journey to uncover racial bias in facial recognition technologies that are commercially available. And I think why this was so terrifying to me was because uh, this was not technology on a shelf somewhere. This was technology that was actively being sold to the FBI, actively being sold to ICE, our immigration officials, um, actively being sold and deployed by police departments all across the country, uh, often with no one that we elected 
giving any kind of oversight, no one that represents we the people, um, you know, giving guidelines on how these technologies can, these racially biased invasive surveillance technologies can be used. And that sort of sets the film on a journey uh, to uncover um, bias in so many of the technologies that we interact with every day. Thank you for that. Um, there, uh, there is a question here in the comments about what has been the biggest surprise after you released the film? I had no idea that tech companies would like it and would invite screenings of the film. I mean, that was, the, no one was shocked more than I was. I mean, uh, I, I don't have a background, as I said, in data science or in, in mathematics, but like you on the call, I don't have any background in STEM. And in many ways, I felt um, a, a good deal of imposter syndrome when I began making the film. Um, I was terrified that I would misuse the terminology and um, someone would laugh at my research. And I think that, um, you know, for many of us who feel vulnerable and like we don't belong, it's exactly why we need to be sitting at these tables where the decisions are being made. And that's sort of why I made Coded Bias, uh, because I think when it comes to artificial intelligence, all of the knowledge has been in the hands of the few. So all of the power has been in the hands of the few. And one of the things that I hope the film does is pull up a chair for all of us and say that we all have a place at the table because these decisions are deployed on all of us. And so I never imagined that some of the most powerful tech companies in the world would host screenings of this film um, for their employees and spark discussions within big tech um, about bias and about ethics. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. Um, well, you talk about, you know, pulling a seat up at the table. I think it was symbolic in the film at the end, how you reflected the, the people that, you know, after the policies happened and, you know, they went back to the community, say in New York, and they were really overjoyed that what they, um, what they brought to light, actually now there was action upon it. So I think that's really important that we all have the capability for change, I think, in all of this. So there is another question about how long did it take to make the film or maybe the time frame that the film was made? The film was made over two years. It, it was an independent film. Um, and that's actually very quick for an independent documentary to be made in that amount of time. And, um, and it was made, I think in four different countries, um, South Africa, the US, China, Oh my goodness, am I, UK. And, um, and so um, it, it was a very short time period to make a film. And I think the hardest part of that was the editing and actually uh, trying to get the film to make sense because, um, you know, for me, it was quite daunting to sit with all of these PhDs and try to distill their dissertation into two minutes that is somehow cinematic and entertaining and, um, and, and somehow has some of the integrity of um, the science in it. And, and so I think the complexity of the science communication was really challenging, especially when I had never seen a film that attempted to do what my film did in terms of explaining how algorithms and AI and bias work. And um, the other thing that was really important in the making of this film was connecting the film to people who had skin in the game, who had something to lose. I think oftentimes technologists are thinking in the, in the pixels, they're thinking the ones and the zeros, and they're often disconnected from the impacts of the systems that they're creating. And so one of the things that the film sought to do was not only to you know, distill complex science and information, but also to connect that science information to the so what to the stakes, um, to the people who have uh, the most to lose when these systems fail. Um, thank you for that. So a next question is, um, did what you see about bias and coding change the way you look at filmmaking or notice bias in other areas of your life? 
Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think that um, one thing I've learned is a great deal of compassion for our species um, because bias is not just something that's in white men. It's not something that is in a few bad law enforcement officers. Uh, bias is actually an inherent human condition that we all have and um, we're often unconscious of. And I think what that did is make me realize that um, it's something that we perpetually have to be hyper vigilant about and have to control for. And that means that inclusion is actually absolutely essential in the in sort of building inclusive teams and not just for the communities that have been historically oppressed, but um, actually for, you know, uh, you know, when these technologies are deployed on the world, it's actually essential in creating more innovation, more innovative technologies. Um, and being that we do have some students on the line with us, um, in all of your work with the different STEM professionals that, that you worked with, um, you know, is there any advice or maybe themes that you, you encountered again and again as to as they enter their careers as STEM professionals, um, you know, what can they best do to design for equity? And maybe as like a future look of AI and technology and bringing equity to, equity to, to technology. Well, I certainly think inclusion is one of them. Uh, we have a real inclusion crisis in tech. Um, you know, when 14% of the population are AI researchers, that is abysmal and cause for a major investment campaign. I, I couldn't even find statistics about people of color in STEM. And um, that means that we absolutely need to bring more people to the table. And some of that I'm heartened by this new generation of computer science students because they're thinking more interdisciplinary. And I think that's what we really need. They're saying, um, you know, I can't learn about AI or about computer programming. Um, I think I might need a ethics course. I, I think I might need a um, women's studies course. I might need a, a, a black studies or, or a Latino studies course uh, because um, you can't design for the world if you don't know anything about the world. And I think that there is that kind of, um, you know, call for more inter rigorous interdisciplinary approaches to the, to computer science. And, you know, when I speak about inclusion, I'm just not talking about, you know, the demographics of, of, you know, more women, more people of color, more LGBTQ, but also I'm thinking about, um, you know, how can we bring ethicists to the table? How can we bring policymakers to the table? And how can we get a broader spectrum of society at the table uh, when we're designing these systems? Um, the other thing is, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a data scientist and I'm always, um, I'm always a little uh, uh, squeamish when, I, when data scientists ask me how to approach their, um, their craft. But I will say as someone who has, um, who has very much uh, spent a lot of time with data scientists, some of the things that they've taught me that they look at uh, when they're designing algorithmic systems uh, is you know, asking the questions uh, that Kathy O'Neill outlined so well, for whom could the system fail? So when you're, when you're designing a technology, for whom could it fail? And if it does fail, what could go wrong? What are the stakes? Because what I learned in Coded Bias is that I've seen some pretty high stakes scenarios. People don't get healthcare. Uh, people get wrongfully arrested and held. Um, people lose their civil liberties. Uh, people get fired. Uh, people don't get the, 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 the social service that they need. And those are incredibly high stakes. So thinking about when you're designing systems, what the stakes are. Um, the third thing is, 
how transparent is it to know when you've made a mistake, when that error has occurred? I mean, in some cases, what was so astonishing to me is that in many cases, we don't even know we've been discriminated by this new opaque kind of power. I mean, when you take the example of the algorithm um, for hiring that Amazon invented, and uh, these are engineers that had the best of intentions. They actually wanted to level the playing field and make the world more fair. And they thought, we're just gonna put this unbiased algorithm in the mix and get people out of the way. And lo and behold, um, you know, the algorithm was looking at um, data from a, from a past that is ridden with systematic inequalities and looking at who got hired, who got uh, promoted over a number of years, who got retained. And lo and behold, the system starts to discriminate against anyone it can discern was a woman. If you had a woman's sport on your resume, if you had a woman's college on your resume, it would essentially take you out of the applicant pool. And um, this particular system was shut down, but it sort of begs the question, how many times has that happened? Has an invisible gatekeeper denied us an opportunity? And we don't even know why. We just know that we didn't get the interview. We just know we didn't get the healthcare insurance. Uh, we just know that we got higher pricing for something. Um, and so I think how transparent these systems are. Um, it's also my belief that they, the fact that we allow these systems to be proprietary and owned by companies creates this new kind of totalitarian power that we cannot question. We can't look inside what's inside that black box. So to me, some of it is about transparency. And I know that there have been uh, designers on the forefront sort of pushing for more transparent design. And, um, you know, the last thing is really about how easy is it to get a human in the loop, to fix whatever has gone wrong now that we know it's gone wrong. How easy is it to get a human on the phone and say, sorry, I was, I was discriminated against. I was um, you know, this machine is, is, is not being fair. There's a flaw in the system. And how easy is it to repair that, to sort of, um, to fix that, to, to make reparations? And I think that those are some of the things that I would think about if I were a young computer scientist. Um, thank you for that. So these next two questions go maybe hand in hand or maybe uh, side by side, I don't know. Um, it's about feedback. Um, so the first thing is, have you received any feedback from educational institutions about the film? And then the second was, have you received any negative backlash? Or so I don't know if, you know, hopefully those <laughs> negative and institu institutions don't align, but, um, you know, just maybe talking about the response you've had from various people. The response has been overwhelmingly warm. Um, I mean, the film has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's um, got incredible um, warm reception from the critics. Um, I never imagined that technology companies would screen the film. Uh, universities have been screening the film um, and teaching it, using it as a tool to teach, which I'm incredibly grateful for. And um, I don't think there has been a big backlash against the film or that, you know, I might get a disgruntled note or two, but that's not the vast majority of responses. And um, if I had any pushback, it would be um, getting insured for the film. Uh, there are more laws that govern my conduct and um, would make me liable if I say something that's untrue than govern Facebook. And so, uh, you know, technology companies aren't liable for what's posted on their platforms. But for me, I had to get what's called errors and in emission insurance. And basically what it is is saying, to, to my best knowledge, I vetted this film for the truth. And an, an insurance company is going to insure me just in case there was something. And with it, you have to produce, you know, sort of like a, a dissertation of every fact in the film cited by many sources. 
And when it came time to insure my film for Sundance, uh, the insurance company had a hard time. And I said, what are you talking about? Like, this is all like written about in, in, the, in the New York Times and um, the Washington Post and very well reported on. And they would literally said to me, it doesn't matter if it's true, it's Amazon. And I think what that meant is that these companies are so powerful that they can take you on. And, and, and I'm grateful that they didn't end. <laughs> Um, but that was definitely um, something that I was aware of in terms of my fear of what a backlash could be, what others feared for me a backlash could be given the amount of power uh, that the companies that I'm critiquing have in the world. And I think that power itself, the immensity of that power itself, the consolidation of that opaque kind of power is actually a threat to democracy itself. Um, so maybe as a follow-up to that question, um, the end of the film had uh, had it just kind of mentioning like Amazon had taken a year off, you know, to to pause and reflect on on their policies. Or in two, 2020, legislation was introduced federally, um, you know, against um, against uh, facial recognition, and a couple cities had out outlawed it. Have you been in contact, or do you know maybe since 2020? you know, maybe where Amazon is at or where legislation is at or, you know, additional progress because of the film? Well, I will say that in the making of this film, I saw sea change that I never thought was possible, which is three of the largest technology companies in the world changed their policy around selling facial recognition to law enforcement. So IBM in an unprecedented move uh, got out of the facial, facial recognition game. They won't research it, they won't deploy it, they disrupted their entire business model, they're done. And I think that is um, something that I applaud. Microsoft said that they would stop selling facial recognition to law enforcement. And Amazon said they would take a one-year pause uh, by which I, I think we have just two months left. Uh, that time frame is getting shorter and shorter. But I think it's really important to note why this sea change, what made the sea change possible. And I think it's because of brave scientists like Joy Bellamwini, like Dr. Timnit Gebru, who was recently fired from Google uh, to speak truth to power and um, to be in the rooms where these decisions are made and to put their academic reputations on the line unencumbered by corporate interest. So we need those kinds of brave scientists um, in the rooms where the de these decisions are made. I think that, um, I hope that the film played some small role in mass literacy, because I really believe that um, that's exactly what we need. A 10 year old is gonna start using a smartphone in the fifth grade. And that is exactly the age that we should start teaching about um, what's happening to your data, why you're getting a certain ad when uh, someone else is getting a different ad. And I think uh, we are just so lacking in basic literacy. It wasn't until making this film that I could start to discern what is actual science and what is you know, bogus baloney pseudoscience that's being peddled by corporations um, to make money. Uh, take, for instance, the um, algorithm that arbitrarily decided Daniel Santos was a bad teacher. That was actually an algorithm that was designed, I kid you not, um, to judge fertility in bowls and somehow it gets implemented to judge whether a teacher is, is, is a good teacher. And that value added model is still being used and teachers across the country, including Florida, are still uh, fighting against the use of that model. So I think literacy is really key. And I wouldn't underestimate the power of literacy because I think the communities that have been the most educated have been the first to ban these systems or to pass local policy. When you consider that it was, um, you know, San Francisco, Oakland, uh, Cambridge, uh, Somerville, all technological hubs where they know how these systems work that really um, uh, were the first to ban facial recognition by law enforcement and in their municipality. 
So uh, that is the power of literacy. But I, I think, you know, when we talk about policy and, and we still have, you know, every sort of protection we have was basically invented before the advent of the internet. So it's kind of clear that policy is not keeping pace with technological development. And oftentimes our policymakers don't even know really what time it is. They, they themselves are not literate. You have sitting senators who are asking Mark Zuckerberg how Facebook makes its money. And he and Mark Zuckerberg has to say, we sell advertisements, Senator. And I think that 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 speaks to, to literacy, but it also speaks to the fact that it's not going to be some sort of enlightened policymakers that give us our rights. Uh, when Joy calls uh, algorithmic justice the unfinished work of the civil rights movement, I quite agree. And if you look how civil rights happened, it didn't happen from letting policymakers all of a sudden uh, giving us our rights. It came from people uh, taking the streets, uh, calling their representative, um, reaching out. Um, it came through citizen engagement, people raising their voices in unison. And I think that um, the timing of these three companies making this massive shift is really important because it was June 2020. Uh, Joy's research had been out uh, for two years. My film had been out for six months. And that timing is really important because that's when you had people of all colors arm in arm in the streets in the largest movement of, for civil rights and equality that we've seen in 50 years um, to protest the unjust murder of George Floyd. And I think what happened there in that sort of those three things coming together, um, brave scientists, uh, AI literacy and civic engagement is that you saw people drawing the connections between racially biased invasive surveillance technology in the hands of law enforcement with no one that we elected watching, with no one that represents we the people giving any oversight and the communities that could be most harmed, uh, the communities that could be most brutalized by these type of technologies. And I think that, um, that that is actually what it takes to make, to move the dial on these issues. And, and um, it's my hope with this um, new administration that we will see some sort of uh, policy. And I'm, I'm actually working very hard to get this film in front of um, democratic lawmakers. I'd like the Republicans to see it too, actually. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, so there are a couple, one is just, uh, is there going to be a book about coded bias or any future work, maybe a follow-up film in the works or additional book or any other? Um... Well, you can go to codedbias.com backslash take action and you will find uh, many of the authors in Coded Bias on that reading list. If you scroll down, there's an entire reading list. Some of them are books. Some of them are things that are free and available online for more resources that you can uh, use. And on that website are also great uh, um, organizations, heroic organizations uh, like Color of Change, Mi Gente, Electronic Frontier Foundation, the ACLU, um, and so many others that are doing great work in the field. Um, that we that really need our support. So it's my hope that Coded Bias is is the first of many films and many books I, uh, that have. I mean, the scholarship and the books have been there for twenty years before I I I, I got here. But um, it, I hope that this is a movement that we will continue to grow. And I did go ahead and put that link in the chat there. So. Um, another question was, as you worked through this process, did you come across any material on bias and use of fingerprints in AI recognition programs or any other type of recognition software other than facial recognition? Yes, this is someone who hasn't seen the movie because there are very many examples of all different um, uses of by, I mean, uh, sort of demonstrations of bias in AI in the film from um, hiring to healthcare um, to predatory ads. Um, there, there are very many examples of how this is embedded in sort of the crude logic of how algorithms work. 
Um, and then another question is, how are you working to get it in front of lawmakers? How does someone help to spread the word about the film? And maybe um, either on like a national level or possibly even on a local, like a, like a city state level. You know, well, I'm really lucky because I, I think that films are um, an extension of my engagement in the world. So um, I'm also an activist in the sense that I have many long relationships with uh, grassroots organizers and organizations in the fields that I'm working in. And I tend to start those conversations early in the filmmaking process. And they're my partners in the work. And I ask them about what they're working on and what their cam ongoing campaigns are. And um, that sort of makes the sort of next steps around the film um, important. So Color of Change helped bring it to the Black Congressional Caucus. Um, and so through partnerships like that, we help get it in front of lawmakers. And also, you know, I tend to research what lawmakers care about these issues, which one of them might be most likely to, to, to pass a bill. And I sort of work that way also to try to put pressure where I think there might be a little room, a little wiggle room, a little PowerPoint to make change. And, you know, the other thing I just want to say is that one of the things that I do pretty regularly when I'm feeling something about the world that I live in is I'm in more close contact with my representatives. Sometimes I want to put it on Twitter or on Facebook. And, and because I made this film, I know that kind of goes to the sphere of people who think like me. And instead, I, you know, my representatives are Schumer and Gillibrand. And sometimes I'm like, let me hit up Schumer and Gillibrand really quick. Let them know how I'm feeling. Because every time you write to your representative, they put a one next to the issue that you contacted them about. You know, your voice gets, um, you know, heard. And if they hear from 50 or 100 or thousands of their constituents around these issues like algorithmic justice, that is also how change can happen. And, and it takes the same amount of time as throwing out a tweet or a, a social media post. So the next question is, <clears throat> much of the storytelling was enhanced by camera, camera techniques, visual effects, and editing. Um, as the director, this, did this come from your initial vision, and were you involved in every step of this, or, and, or did you have to search for the right people to do the editing and visual effects to realize this vision? Well, both. I'm definitely involved in every step of this film, and especially this film, because this film was made independently, and it was very much a film that I made with my hands and edited my, you know, uh, much of it myself and produced and directed. Um, the visual effects are, are, are by um, a dear friend and, and colleague um, who, who won an award for his work, uh, Zachary Literature of, of Decoit Pictures. And um, he's wonderful to collaborate with. What you do is you find collaborators and you give them sort of a vision of what you'd like to cr create. And in my case, um, I pulled from a lot of science fiction, um, sort of the visual language of the science fiction worlds that I knew so well to help people understand how AI is working in the now. So you see me sort of pulling from the well-known tropes of science fiction in the film, and that is definitely by design. Um, I definitely thought a lot about Mr. Robot framing. Um, in terms of the worlds that I was trying to create was within the film. And then, you know, you have collaborators like my DP Steve Acevedo or, you know, my visual effects um, designer Zachary Ludisher. And basically they bring more to it, um, which is wonderful. In the case of Zachary, he's such a wonderful uh, visual storyteller in the, in the world of effects. So I would give him an idea um, and he would just run with it. I'm still amazed by that uh, scene at the end of the film where we create the Soviet Union. Um, that is literally just like two slides of projection on a, on a huge wall and um, someone from the crew sort of sitting in for a minute so that we can sort of create that world. And so um, a lot of it is, is, is having a vision, having great collaborators that you trust, and you hopefully end up with something better than you both imagined. So 
So to play devil's advocate a little, um, in the film, you had, um, you know, you mentioned you spotlight in different countries and in China, um, it seemed like some people were on board with the technology. Maybe the keyword is transparency. Like they were very aware of what they were doing and some seem to be okay with that. Um, I know a lot has to depend on, you know, culture and, you know, a lot of other things around, but do you see um, any aspect possibly even here in the United States where, where it would or could be okay with transparency involved, um, you know, the technologies um, or was there any, you know, um, you know, positive uses, or, you know, I don't want to say positive, but, you know, possible uses with transparency disclaimers. Absolutely. I mean, I think China is sort of a black mirror episode inside of the documentary, but it's also a reality that is sort of right here for all of us, because all of our behavior is making being remade by these systems. How often have we judged someone based on how many Instagram followers they have, or, how many, um, you know, wanted to delete something because you didn't get enough likes. And so it's re sort of, it's create remaking our social behavior. That being said, I, I don't think I'm a huge techie. And, you know, people always ask me, do you think they're good uses? Are there times that it could be proper use? And, you know, times where things should be banned. And I think that I'm asking a different question with coded bias, which is who gets to decide? Who gets to make that decision? And I think right now we have big tech selling to law enforcement with no one that we elected giving government, giving any oversight. And that is deeply scary to me. And I was on a panel with a legal scholar named Patricia Williams, and she said, they call it AI testing, but what it really is, is human experimentation. And I thought that was a beautiful framing because you have technology companies essentially picking up new tools and experimenting with our civil rights. And, you know, for me, I might be in favor of a a very specific use of facial recognition. Someone co goes before a judge and says, I would like a warrant for this usage and that. But, but essentially what we have here in the US is a wild, wild west. What Ravi Nayak de describes as a wild, wild west in the film. Um, it's like living in a world uh, of the automobile before we had uh, you know, seatbelt laws and a car seat for your baby. It's like getting a pharmaceutical product with no counterindications and no usage label. And you're just supposed to use it any kind of way. That is the kind of dangerous, unregulated industry that artificial intelligence is right now. And um, that is a clear and present danger to democracy. And so to me, it is really about how can we put some policies in place? I mean, um, the UK has the, well, the UK when it was part of Europe had um, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regimen. And um, it was sort of the first framework in the world to really put data rights in a civil rights framework, to put data rights in a human rights framework. And I think that's really important. And Europe just um, announced a whole other set of regulations on AI, um, particularly around these high stakes uh, usages that have to do with, you know, livelihood and liberty. And um, we are home to all these technology companies and we don't have any of these policies. And so I'm in favor of what Kathy O'Neill says, which is sort of uh, an AI, a uh, FDA for algorithms. Um, you know, the idea that these systems should be vetted uh, by some sort of third party for health and safety. Right now we have a system where the companies roll it out and then we, then some people get hurt and then we decide, oh, maybe this isn't such a good, good idea. We should take it back. And I think that that it should be the opposite. You should have to prove that you're not going to do any harm and that you're not going to discriminate and that you won't be racist, that you won't be sexist, that your technology uh, uh, won't um, interfere with civil and human rights before we put it out. 
And that is what I'm in favor of, is this question of who gets to decide in our society uh, what is fair use of these technologies. Um, and I think when you said that there was a comment earlier in the chat, so it's more of a comment than a question, but that the UNM School of Law is doing a lawyer's view of the film's issues at the end of the month. And I think it's important to know, like how you had said, um, you know, I think it seems like cyber law, <laughs> cyber technology, it just seems like a, a catch up here. It seems like there's, you know, always trying to catch up with the emerging technologies. Um, the next question is, did you experience a lot of challenges finding information when you were in the UK and China? Oh, yes, but I love that kind of stuff um, that I'm a documentarian, so I'm a bit of a sleuth and um, I, I really like rigorous research. I am that kind of person who loves to research uh, incredibly rigorously, so I enjoyed it. I think that um, those scenes that were shot in the UK, uh, particularly of that 14-year-old uh, black child that gets wrongly misidentified by facial recognition uh, by the police trialing this technology, uh, that could only be um, filmed in the UK because we have no laws here in the US that would make that process transparent to a third party like me. Um, in the UK, because they have some of these data rights protections, um, they actually were, the police had to be transparent of their trial of facial recognition. And that allowed um, the third party human rights observer, in this case, Big Brother Watch, to observe what was happening and, and, and why I was able to include it in the film versus here in the States, uh, we don't have any laws. And so I could have never captured a scene like that here in the US. Um, you know, it's important to say that in Detroit, a, um, a black man was um, arrested in front of his family and his neighbors. He was um, held for 30 hours in a cell and never asked for his license. And it came out later that he had been wrongly identified by facial recognition used by police. And in spite of that, the Detroit Police Department continues to use facial recognition. And so here in the US, uh, those stories are, are um, invisible to us. They are opaque to us. And that is exactly what makes these systems so dangerous is that it's very hard sometimes to know when we've been wronged by a technology. And it was hard to find people who were fighting back. And I very much relied on existing research uh, from people like Kathy O'Neill's book, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction to help suss out those kinds of stories. Um, and you mentioned the UK who had, um, I guess maybe more of an openness with their digital laws, um, but say like in China where it's a favorable policy or seemingly favorable to, to some, um, was footage hard to obtain there? Or did you, was it hard to find um, willing information and participants? Yes, I mean, uh, China does not have freedom of press uh, like we do in democratic societies. So oftentimes, you know, if you're filming there, you are sort of uh, walking the party line and they'll, they'll bring someone from the state government to, to, to follow you. And I was sort of aware, we did an independent production in China, and I was sort of aware that um, someone speaking out against the facial recognition technology might have been in danger, might have been dangerous. Um, so this is the person that we got, and this is both sincerely what she thought. Um, and so that that's sort of what happened there. Okay, and the next question is, was it hard or what is hard to make the film? So maybe challenges you encountered while you were making your film? Oh, it's all challenging. <laughs> it's also challenging. But I, but I think the biggest challenge was actually making the film make sense. Uh, it's a tricky little film. <laughs> it's a tricky little film with a, with a lot of scientific substance. And I think that that science communication was incredibly difficult. And I remember when I first test, you, you do oftentimes what's called a test screening. And you do it at the rough cut stage before the film is over. And you invite a bunch of friends over and give them pizza and make them watch your movie and, and fill out a survey for you about what was understandable. And it was... I felt like I was hurting them. I was like, I'm sorry, I'm putting you through this film. It's really intellectual and dense. And it was really, really hard. I was so terrified that 
it was going to be so heady that it was going to be completely unwatchable and unentertaining. And that was really, really difficult is trying to balance this very, I think this film that has a lot of complex scientific ideas in it, technological ideas in it, and also make it entertaining and palatable and something that you can actually sit through in one sitting. I do have another question with regards just to um, to your your career path. And so within Mesa, I know um, we are working on some digital media programming and that's an emerging technology within STEM. And so um, what advice would you give to somebody maybe wanting to go into film, like either coursework here? I know you mentioned maybe some paths to take and, you know, but uh, maybe some classes, coursework, um, you know, any- yes. uh, yeah, I, I think that it's not just it's STEM, but it's it's STEAM. You got to put the art in the in the science and technology um, subjects. And I think that I, I I would say do all of it. I mean, whatever is available, I think you should take advantage of. And I think particularly in science, you can sort of practice making small films that explain things. And these days you you can find a captive audience sort of on, on smaller platforms and see how you do and keep making them better. But the best thing is to sort of get a mentor who works in the field and to start making work and showing it to them and getting advice and actually learn by doing is the best way. Um, most of what you have to learn in filmmaking can be taught in four hours. You know, it's, 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 it's not difficult. I mean, it is difficult when you get into things, but basic filmmaking, you can sort of teach in a short amount of, in a short workshop. I think the harder part is the writing and what it is that you have to say. And um, I think that that many of that is to start at the writing process. People don't underestimate writing because writing can give you the backbone of your, of your story. Um, and so as a, um, another question was, what was your favorite part of making or about the film? Um, well, honestly, <laughs> it's when the film is over. <laughs> it is really when the film is over because um, for a filmmaker, their work doesn't start having meaning until often months or years after the film is finished. And I was so grateful that I got to see this film at Sundance with an audience because it was the you know one of the last screenings. It was probably a super spreader event before before the world shut shut down, and um, you know seeing your film in a packed hall, um, there's nothing like it. And seeing when people laugh or you didn't know where something's going to happen, and you're like, oh, I need to go in and recut that scene a little bit because um, you're you're just feeling with the audience, what's happening, I think is really important. And, you know, it's conversations like this one. Um, it's, it's the idea that uh, my greatest work really happens when the light, when the, after the credits roll on my film and the lights come up and people say, oh my God, I just saw this film. What do we do now? And I think that it, it's that moment for me, that engagement of the viewer with the material that, that gives my, my life and my work meaning. Um, and then maybe just as a closing question, um, you know, any last words of advice for all of us to be vessels for change and continue to work towards designing for equity and, um, you know, working towards social justice and, you know, within technology or otherwise? Well, um, you know, I think that there's a lot that you can do at the school level. I would not underestimate the power of local action in terms of um, changes that can be made in your school community, in the kind of, um, in the ways in which computer science is taught about whose stories are included in the, in the curriculum around computer science. Um, I think when you when you create local policy at your school, it sort of um, disrupts the ubiquitous power that big tech has. Um, I think you can definitely support one of the incredible heroic 
organizations on the codedbias.com website that are doing incredible work on the field, Amnesty International, Algorithmic Justice League, ACLU, Color of Change, Mi Gente, Electronic Frontier Foundation, and so, uh, Parents for a Commercial Free Childhood, so many others that are doing just incredible work to move the dial. And then, you know, the last thing is that you would think that I think that sometimes when I speak to technologists like you, um, there is this sort of impetus to think about this as a technological problem, that um, it was just bad data, you know, and we'll just fix the data and then, you know, we'll create this perfect super intelligence and, you know, everything will be fine. And I think that for me, it's, it's, not about creating the perfect algorithm. It's about creating a more humane society. And sometimes in some cases that means as a, as a design element that we don't use the algorithm at all. That's how I'm different than sort of technologists. And um, to me, I think that when I hear technologists speak, uh, you'd think that the goal of human civilization was to go as fast as possible and to be as efficient as possible. And you have to sometimes stop and think is the goal of my life to go as fast as possible and to be as efficient as possible? Is the goal of our civilization to do that? Or is it actually um, to build a culture, to build a school, um, to build a civilization that honors the inherent dignity of every human being? And if we are doing that, then it requires a completely different way of designing and deploying these kinds of technological systems. So it's my hope that all of you, when you are sitting in these decision-making rooms where uh, these systems are being built, uh, that you will not leave your humanity at the door, that you will bring it into the rooms where you are designing uh, because you have a tremendous amount of power to impact the world. I think that's a tremendous closing statement right there. <laughs> So um, thank you so much. We are here at the end of our time with you, but I wanna thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for sharing your journey um, and just allowing us to gain some insight into um, this incredible film and you know how you got there. Um, some last closing housekeeping announcements. Um, in the chat, I did put up um, an attendance link and um, also our survey. Mesa students that are on the line, um, if you want credit for participation today, definitely make sure you complete that. That is my only way of marking attendance for you. Um, and all others, please feel free to, um, you know, put in any comments or feedback for us on our series. But thank you for joining us today. And to many of you that has joined us on our series throughout the year, I want to thank you for, um, for taking this virtual journey with us. Um, but with that, I will go ahead and close out the session. I'm going to stop the recording, but I will remain on for any last um, closing questions from anybody. Thank you so much. It was an honor.